wow, it's amazing that there's all this innovation out here and all these cool apps. But if I can't get them to actually integrate with my overall marketing operations, my overall marketing stack, it doesn't matter. It's like the tree that falls in the forest. You just can't hear it. And so everyone, I mean, survey after survey after survey, year after year after year, marketers are like, hey, integration is one of the most important things to us for good reason. And so composability is just almost even like the next step of that of saying like, okay, once we even have these things integrated, now we can sort of start to reconfigure the way our business runs across these integrated apps. The past is gone. Now is the future. This is the MarTech Show. Exploring today's marketing technology solutions. Social media. Artificial intelligence, augmented reality, now is the future. content, SEO, email, analytics, listening, advertising, and more. I'm your host, Mike Alton, and I'm joined by agency owner and technology futurist, Robin Diamond. Each episode explores the latest developments in marketing technology and shares new solutions and innovative approaches that you need to know about to grow your business today. And now, the rest of today's episode. Welcome back to the MarTech Show, where Robin and I get to dish on what's shiny and new in the market space and do deep dives into specific platforms or solutions that can help you and your business today. Hey, Robin, how are you doing? Fantastic. Happy Tuesday, right? Happy yeah. Tuesday when we're recording this. It's a week <laughs> after May the 4th, so Star Wars Day, which was also very close to MarTech Day for those who celebrate. Because on the back of AI, the marketing technology landscape has now exploded to over 14,000 products and solutions covering everything from advertising to social media and relationships, from business intelligence and interactive content to data visualization and compliance and privacy. How do we process all this rapid growth and what takeaways can we glean from the past year's developments? Well, that's exactly what Scott Brinker is going to talk to us about. Scott's been analyzing marketing technology and its impact on marketing organizations for more than a decade as the editor of the Chief MarTech blog, and he serves as VP of Platform Ecosystem at HubSpot, helping to grow and nurture the company's community of technology partners. He authored the best-selling book, Hacking Marketing, and co-authored the bestseller, The New Automation Mindset, and he holds degrees in computer science from Columbia University and Harvard University and an MBA from MIT. Hey, Scott, welcome to the show. Wow. Yeah. Thanks for iterating all my student debt there. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> How are you coming along with that debt? <laughs> so happy to have you. Let's just dive right in because I want to start with a little bit of context. Tell us about the state of MarTech reports uh, that you've built. Who else is involved in that and how long you've been doing it? Sure. So uh, uh, Franz Riemersma and I, uh, Franz Riemersma uh, runs uh, MarTech Tribe. Uh, he and I have been collaborating here for the past three years on both the marketing technology landscape, which as it's grown <laughs> from where it started like 13 years ago with like 150 products to the craziness, you know, that we just recently released of over 14,000, it definitely takes a village. And so I've been very uh, grateful to work with Franz over these past few years collectively and how we build and maintain that. And then we sort of got into a mode where like, okay, listen, we want to release this. We want to celebrate MarTech, the people who work in MarTech, marketing operations. So we suggested that there should be a MarTech day. I mean, there's a day for everything uh, out there on the planet. So, hey, why not one for MarTech day? You, you know, there's chocolate ice cream day, you know, there's, <laughs> um, you know, pepperoni, double pepperoni pizza day. So there's now MarTech day. And we figured we would release the MarTech landscape on that day, right now the first Tuesday in May. And by the way, in 2027, that intersects with Star Wars Day as well, too, which for me, like MarTech and Star Wars, they come together. It's, it's Nirvana, Sold. you know, and we figured, OK, well, you know, it's not just about seeing a whole bunch of tiny microscopic logos on a slide. I know how much everyone enjoys that, you know, the annual eye test for everyone in this industry. But really, like, OK, stepping back from sort of the shock factor of that, and can we sort of dive into like, okay, what are the dynamics that are actually evolving in the industry, both around the, you know, the product landscape and what's in there, but also more importantly, like how are things changing about the way people architect and structure and incorporate these marketing technologies into their, into their business? 
So that's what uh, the state of the MarTech report is uh, dives into from a few different angles. And uh, yeah, happy to talk with you in more detail about it. Yeah, for those of you listening, we'll have links in the show notes because if you haven't actually seen the the landscape slide that, that Scott just mentioned, it's this massive PDF with tiny microscopic logos in different categories of marketing technology, like social media marketing and so on. And beyond that, they're actually clickable. So you can mouse over them and click through to their websites. It's an enormous amount of work today. It was an enormous amount of work 13 years ago, as anyone who's ever tried to program a link in a PDF can attest. But to do over 10,000 of those, 14,000 of those, that's incredible. Incredible is one adjective, you know, <laughs> there might be other adjectives that are perhaps slightly less flattering, but yeah, it, it's a project. I feel yeah. like that leads us into like the next thing before we dig into specifics, what stood out or surprised you at a high level doing this? Yeah. I mean, there were actually a number of surprises this year. So I guess one thing that maybe wasn't a surprise was the fact that, you know, you know, these LLMs, these generative AI engines that got released starting about a year and a half ago, boy, they have just proliferated throughout the marketing industry, a whole bunch of industries, but certainly marketing. And some of this has been existing MarTech products that have added in generative AI functionality to their products. But it's also spawned this incredible explosion of all sorts of new little startups and like MarTech projects that are leveraging those tools. It's just a very fluid and experimental stage, you know, for what's happening. And so when we actually tallied it up to see something like 3,000 new products introduced in MarTech here just over the past year, the vast majority of them have been something that's leveraging, you know, these generative AI capabilities. And you know, there's questions of like, okay, well, how many of those are actually sustainable businesses? That's a different angle to this. I suspect in reality, very few of them, you know, but it'll be interesting to sort of see like, okay, which ones actually do turn into businesses, which ones get absorbed by existing companies. So I expect we'll see quite a bit of evolution in that landscape in the year ahead. But the other thing that was actually really surprising about the landscape itself this year was speaking of churn how little churn there was from 2023 to 2024. It was one of the lowest years of churn, 2.1% in the history of the MarTech landscape. And that was particularly surprising because like 2023 was a really hmm. year for uh, the SaaS industry, a tough year for a lot of industries, but certainly SaaS. I think there was the expectation that, okay, a lot of these MarTech companies from 2023 aren't going to survive until 2024. And the reality is actually most of them have. Now, just because they've survived doesn't mean, you know, some of them might be mortally wounded. You know, some of them may have been acquired, but haven't yet been absorbed, you know, into the mothership. You know, I do expect we'll see that change here over this next year. But one of the interesting reflections we had on it is when you actually stop and think about it, SaaS companies are kind of hard to kill. You know, like once you actually have a set of subscribers, you're providing value to them. If you're, if you go into a sort of survival mode where it's basically about keeping the lights on, the, you know, cogs associated with, you know, running these things in the cloud can be pretty minimal. And so, well, I am sure we will see these iterative waves where some of the attempts at creating MarTech products that ultimately didn't pan out will go away. It kind of makes sense that, okay, Okay, they're not going to all go away in like, you know, one month. And it might be actually sort of a long, a long trip uh, before we actually see that shuffling happen. That makes a lot of sense to me. There was a tool that I used to use, I still do technically, that uh, is for amplifying blog content. Uh, you go in there and you join groups of other people with similar interests. And when you have a new blog post via RSS feed, they all see it and maybe they share it to their social media and so on. That was a bought or sold like a decade ago. And they've had like zero development, zero features, zero iteration since then. And it's just kind of limped along. And every year, every other month, I look at it, I'm like, how are you still alive? <laughs> but but to your point, they probably have very, very minimal overhead, if anything. So they can continue to limp along. But you mentioned AI. And one of the things I wanted to ask you to kind of pick apart for us a little bit was that I know, similar to how HubSpot has this whole ecosystem of, of apps and app providers, OpenAI and the ChatGPT have this ecosystem of you know custom GPTs. And you know a, a lot of these kind of feel like maybe they're their own 
apps was that reflected in that that landscape or what's the distinction there yeah so this was a interesting philosophical discussion around that so what we did was we looked at actually thousands of gpts from open ai's store and the decision we made was okay if if there is a separate website where someone's actually selling a product that is that GPT is a part of, then okay, that that may qualify here to be a part of the Martech landscape because it is kind of represented out in the world as you know an independent entity. If it's simply just a GPT that's available in the OpenAI GPT store, we're not going to put on the landscape. And so there was something like another three thousand <laughs> marketing related GPTs that we just disqualified as a result. But it was an interesting discussion because you're like, well. Why, you know, is, you know, can we get to a place where these custom GPTs, why are they not as legitimate of a MarTech product or solution, you know, as sort of any other standalone like SaaS product, you know, that's out there. And I think this is going to be a question we're going to have to face a lot more in the next year or two ahead is, you know, the whole nature of generative AI and how it's showing up and, you know, the, the, the evolution this has on even like how we get work done, how marketers engage with things, it's shifting. And so the MarTech landscape isn't going to look the way it looked like 10 years ago. It's going to be something kind of different in the years ahead. And yeah, maybe at that some point here, a GPT agent becomes one of the more powerful pieces of MarTech in your stack. Well, I think that's definitely true. And now we have a hack to get on the 2025 landscape. I can just sell a $5 chat GPT from my website and I qualify. <laughs> Knock yourself out. <laughs> I, I think it's incredible. And, and where you're talking about, like, this is the part that excites us is to hear these things and what you're saying like yeah it's changed there's 2023 2024 this is what's happening in 2025 in your report you talked about the first and second stages of martech and it seems really important for people to understand these distinct distinctions so if you wouldn't mind just sharing where marketing technology is going can you can you break these down for us because you're you're giving us so much insight if you could break it down even more about the first and second stages Sure. So the way I sort of characterize the first age of MarTech, which I sort of roughly put is like the 2010s to, you know, 2020, was it was largely about dichotomies. So like in software, the big debate was, is it sweet versus best of breed? You know, another dichotomy was, okay, are you a services company or are you a software company? And then even for, you know, individual businesses thinking about how they would implement MarTech, it was a choice between, are we going to build it? Are we going to buy it? And some of these dichotomies, like, you know, people would like have brutal, like, you know, fights. Well, all right, maybe not like physical fist fights. Maybe there was one, but, you know, I mean, like there'd be like really, you know, vigorous debate around like, oh, should we build, should we buy? Is, are you a services company? Or are you a software company? Should you go sweet or best of breed? And what we anticipated and has absolutely come to materialize here is in the second age of MarTech, you know, which is really in this decade, is we've gone from these dichotomies to those things largely converging. So for instance, instead of sweet versus best of breed, for almost everyone, it's like, no, I actually, I want both. I want these platform ecosystems where, yeah, I'm probably gonna have one or two like major products that are the backbone of my stack, but then I wanna have all these, you know, specialist apps that I have the option to like plug into that backbone and integrate it. Instead of this hard dichotomy between software and services, we now see, a ton of software companies that offer services, uh, partly because like, hey, this is, we sometimes label it under customer success, but what is it about? It's about actually teaching, you know, customers how to be successful with, you know, the software, not just giving them a subscription, and, but also services companies, you know, increasingly like almost all of the major SIs, we're seeing even now smaller agencies, because there's no barriers to creating software, they're sort of taking some of their, you know, secret sauce that they've used in services, they're packing it up into products. Maybe they're using these products as a way to like attract new business. Maybe they're doing it as a way to make more efficient operations. Maybe it's a way to extend relationships with clients, whole bunch of interesting things happening. But now, yeah, you look at these business models and they are very often a blend of software and services. And then even like the build versus buy arguments, they're kind of fading too, where people are like, well, listen, we don't want to, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, you know? So we're going to 
buy, you know, any of these like commercial platforms, you know, even things like, you know, obviously the hyperscaler solutions, you know, out of AWS and Google Cloud. But then on top of these platforms, yeah, we absolutely want the freedom to, you know, create specific experiences, workflows, custom apps that are unique to our business because, you know, we're actually implementing this stuff as part of a digital operating system for our business. And our digital operating system is a little bit different than frankly, everybody else's digital operating system. So we've kind of gone from the world of like, it's, you know, A versus B to like A and B uh, happily ever after. Oh man, so much. I'm sorry, Mike. I know I just have to sit there and say, Scott, like it was almost like every single person in marketing and technology was like, could just look at you and go, that's exactly the conversations we've been in the room over the past few years hearing. <laughs> like they're two like total dichotomies. And now we're like, yeah, we're probably more of a partnership. And we've all like started to be like, yeah, we're a partnership. And I, how you just worded that, that's perfect. I think every single person is going to sit here and agree with you and be like, He's spot on. I feel like he sat in my meetings for the past decade listening to these conversations. Well, well, that doesn't happen too often, you know. Uh, so great, <laughs> awesome. It happened once. I'm happy. <laughs> Everyone agrees. We'll clip. We'll clip that out for you, Scott, and you can play that over and over again. <laughs> yes, here, here's what she said. <laughs> Awesome. We're talking with Scott Brinker about the state of MarTech report that he's just released and how it can inform us on how we might better utilize MarTech in the months and years to come. Similar to how great social media reporting can inform us on which strategies and tactics are working so we can adjust accordingly. Here's a quick message on that. I actually can't say enough great things about the reporting with Agora Pulse. I feel like that is my job security every month. My clients aren't that active on social media, which is why they have me manage their profiles for them. And when they get that report, it verifies that they're making a good investment. The metrics uh, downloads are so simple and easy to read, and it really helps me show where we are doing things right on social and where we need to improve. So I think one of the main reasons why we decided to move to Agora Pulse is because it's a more comprehensive, integrated tool for all of our marketing needs. So rather than what we have had to do historically with Sprout, which is use certain parts of that, that, that platform that work really well and then supplement it with other outside tools, by moving to Agora Pulse, we were able to keep all of that into one, you know, into one technology platform, which is not only a time saver, but it also makes sure that our analytics and all of our reporting is on point because we're pulling all from the same source. It's a really great platform for agencies. It makes it really easy to manage, but gives me really, really, really robust information that actually helps me develop better strategies for my clients and better plans of action. So Scott, there's a substantial section of that report dedicated to this idea of composability. Can you share what that is and why it's a critical concept to today's technologies? Yeah. So when people hear composability has become a bit of a buzzword, you know, in MarTech, like we talk about composable CDPs or composable DXPs. And I think for a lot of normal folks, like the word sounds like, oh boy, that sounds like really techy and weird. But the concepts actually really straightforward, right? You know, the typical metaphor is this idea of Lego blocks that, hey, you know, I mean, if I've got the Lego blocks, I can reconfigure them, you know, however I want for the specific thing I want to build. And the truth is we've been doing composability in tech for years. You know, the, the, the techie version of that is software developers. Anytime they build a product now, they don't build it entirely from scratch. They're like leveraging all sorts of like libraries or APIs in the cloud. And, you know, these become the building blocks, you know, which they then create something original, but they're leveraging a lot of the components to make that happen. On the complete non-technical side of it, the metaphor I'd use would be spreadsheets. I mean, what is a spreadsheet? It's basically a way for, you know, any business user to say like, oh yeah, I want to take some data from here and some data from here, and I want to be able to mash it together and then get something new out of that. So we, we compose things all the time in tech. I think what we really see as like a composability movement in MarTech is it goes to this thing we were talking about with the first stage versus the second age is instead of like sweet versus best of breed or build versus buy, what we're saying is largely companies wanna get these commercial solutions. You know, they don't wanna reinvent the wheel, but when they bring these commercial solutions together, they wanna have a lot of flexibility in, okay, how do we use the different capabilities across our integrated MarTech stack to build 
a workflow that is unique to our business, to build a customer experience that is unique to our business, you know, to put sort of any of that digital operating system in place that's going to be unique to the business. And you do that by composing these capabilities from across these different products. And again, that sounds really techy, but in practice, people are doing this even with like no code tools, you know, uh, little workflow automation tools, uh, you know, Zapier is big in this stuff. And I think now people see with generative AI, you're starting to have these interfaces where, okay, if I can just describe in natural language what it is I want to have happen, you know, the generative AI engine can go ahead and like, oh, well, let me compose that thing you want from this piece here, that piece there, and okay, here you go. So anyways, composability is, yeah, how do we get out of a world where we are adapting our businesses to the software and instead, we're all in a position where we can have the software adapt to our businesses. Amazing. And I think that's something that we all need to be thinking about. You talked a little bit about APIs. So can we go back to that? Now, we know many businesses have reported that APIs, integrations, and how important they are to evaluating their new solutions. But what do you think about the capability really is there? Like, how important is that capability? So APIs are how we do the composability. In fact, actually, if we even go back from the composability side of it, just talk about getting things integrated. I mean, if there's been one story that has been consistent throughout the entire history of the MarTech landscape, uh, it's been, wow, it's amazing that there's all this innovation out here and all these cool apps. But if I can't get them to actually integrate, you know, with my overall marketing operations, my overall marketing stack, it doesn't matter. It's like the tree that falls in the forest. You just can't hear it. And so everyone, I mean, survey after survey after survey, year after year after year, marketers are like, hey, integration is one of the most important things to us for good reason. And so composability is just almost even like the next step of that of saying like, okay, once we even have these things integrated, you know, now we can sort of start to reconfigure the way our business runs, you know, across these integrated apps. APIs are simply the technical mechanism under the covers of how this happens. And so one of the things we uncovered from, you know, this recent report in studying with, you know, like 168 MarTech and marketing operations leaders is... is they take APIs very seriously when they're now evaluating products that, you know, if it doesn't have, you know, great, like it's one of their top three requirements, like for the largest percentage of people of like, yeah, let's make sure this has the API capabilities because they just know that's the key to how they get this integrated into their stack and ultimately how they unlock some of this. Thanks for asking that, Robin, and thanks for answering Scott, because I know at Agorapulse a few years ago, we were trying to talk to our own existing clients and they were saying, we want integrations, we want integrations, but they couldn't articulate why. And so that was a challenge and a stumbling block for our development team. They're like, well, if we don't know why you need this, <laughs> if you need it, and we're not going to spend a lot of time developing it if we don't understand the use case. Today, that's a different story. We're talking to more people and we're seeing fantastic reports like yours that, that much better articulate, not just, yes, we all want integrations, but here's why. <laughs> here's what we expect it to actually do. Mm -hmm. So that can inform the developers, as you mentioned. But as you thought about this, this report and then these conversations that you've had, you're seeing so much happen in this industry, but I'm wondering what's disappointing you? We've got less churn, mm -hmm. which is great. Development is changing. Investment in the industry is changing. Is there anything that you were saying that you're like, ah, oh, I, I can, don't like to see that? Yeah. I mean, I think the, so every year Gartner, well, at least for the past few years, Gartner has published a survey where they ask a bunch of marketing leaders, like what percentage of your MarTech stack are you actually utilizing? You know, and it started as something like 60%, which you could argue wasn't great to begin with, you know, and then like dropped to like 40%. And then like the past year, it like dropped down to like 30%. And you're like, okay, this, this, this is terrible. Like people have all this huge investment in this marketing technology. And essentially they're coming to the conclusion that they're not, they're not actually able to harness it. Now, I think a lot of people, their initial reaction to that is like, okay, well, that's the fault of, you know, the, the tech companies. Like, why are you building this stuff that people can't use? I'm not saying that I don't think, you know, the MarTech vendors, that there aren't ways that they can improve. But my impression is the bigger challenge is we as a 
profession as a discipline around MarTech and marketing operations have under invested in the training, the enablement, you know, we talk a lot about sales enablement and all this work we do to like help salespeople be effective, you know, in their roles, marketing enablement. Oh my goodness. Like marketers have just had so many new capabilities, so many new like tactics that, you know, they're being asked to engage in so many new channels, you know, but the amount of actual support we give them and like the structure we do for, you know, not just like, you know, one-off trainings. Oh, I sat in a class for that once. That was fine. You know, but sort of having these like guided processes of helping people upskill, you know, getting a certain amount of like peer group collaboration across this, it's just the reality is marketing and marketing technology, the frontier of what's possible is advancing at just an insane rate. It's impossible uh, you know, for anyone to keep up with all of this. But if we want our teams and we want our organizations to take advantage of as much of this as possible, boy, I think we need to invest a heck of a lot more in the actual marketing and enablement capability. That's a great observation. We talked a little bit about this in a previous episode with the CMO of Uptempo when he was talking about marketers just, you know, wanting to buy this stuff that looks fantastic without building a lot of internal use cases and, you know, to your point, going through the training and frankly, wasting a lot of money. Yeah. Like Mike dropped. He was just like, and this is it. And, and Scott, what you said is so important for business owners, business owners, C-suite, to listen to, and, and I wanna reiterate this and I wanna put it all over the place because what you said is so imperative. Things are happening at such a fast pace. Like look at this report. And then there's things that are outside of our control that are happening and marketers are being pulled and stretched and they're, they're shrinking teams, but also not training them. You're investing in your sales team, but your marketing team is your sales team. And when people start realizing marketing and tech were together, now they're gonna realize marketing and sales. That's the forefront of your going out there. And I think what you said is so imperative for business owners that that in a world to stand out right now, they need to. So if I can add on one thing to that. So there was a study last fall by the corporate board and they asked a whole bunch of like both junior, mid-level and senior marketers, how are you learning about AI? You know, and, uh, you know, like the most popular things were like, oh, well, I read about it or I like watch a video on the web. And then some of them were like, oh, I sort of experiment with this on my own time, you know, and oh, yeah, maybe I talk to a couple other people I know in the industry way down at the bottom of the list. There was literally like, you know, other than the other category, dead last was oh, I actually get officially trained on how to use this stuff by my company. It was like, you know, single digit or low double digit, you know, like 10%. This is, this is crazy. It's like, you know, we, we, this isn't like this just happened last month. I mean, like, you know, we've now been in this mode. This stuff has been out here for a year, year and a half. And most marketers are not getting any official support, uh, you know, from their organizations in like, how do we actually take advantage of this? No, it's Amen so important. Like everywhere we go, everyone uses the words innovative. AI and you're like, okay, cool. Yeah. Good luck. Go find it on your own. And I think that what you just said, it, <laughs> it's under other, like it's, oh, and then I actually got trained in it. And when you look at what we're being able to use, I mean, I look at my start in this, we will not say how many years ago, decades ago, it was billboards, you know, like a billboard is a billboard. We put it up there. We do, we do the graphic design. Now it is something that's constantly changing every day. And so when you say that there has to be an investment in a training and a learning for people, speaking of that, we're going, and, I, and we could go on forever on this one, but what do you see in MarTech in 2025? If you had your little crystal ball and you were going to tell us where MarTech is going in 2025, what do you think, Scott? All right. Well, I will caveat by saying that one of the reasons I do the MarTech landscape is because I'm absolutely terrible at predicting, you know? And so the MarTech <laughs> landscape is just sort of an empirical assessment of like this year. So we can look back, looking forward, it's hard. That being said, I would frame this as the thing I am most excited about mm -hmm. over this next year is I think these generative AI interfaces, these natural language interfaces, I mean, even we were just chatting, you know, before the show here about, you know, ChatGPT's new, you know, 4.0 model and this interaction mode where you can like talk to it. This is actually a huge net new paradigm in how people interact with software. You know, like this past, like the entire era of SaaS 
has all been point and click. It's like, okay, well, if I want to use a capability in software, I have to figure out the menus, and then I go from this menu to that menu, and then I get to this screen, and what are my configuration options, and do I understand this dropdown, and where do I do? You know, when you get to these more sophisticated platforms, this is one of the reasons why we have all these like, you know, specialist admins and ops folks is because it's a career just learning how to navigate the software. Not even just the things that you want to do, but how do I navigate the software to make it do what I want to do? And I think this is one of the things that's actually created a ceiling to how sophisticated some of the MarTech can get because like, hey, listen, we could make it more sophisticated, but... Is anybody actually going to be able to use it? And what is so exciting is you see these like natural language interfaces and sort of these other kinds of new modes of like, oh, well, if I can just talk to the software. I mean, imagine that. Talk to the software. Hey, this is actually what I want to do. Could you compare these things to it? It could ask clarifying questions. It could bring up, you know, one version. I'm like, no, no, don't change that one. Can you bring the data set? You know, how did that compare to last year? I mean, this is going to unlock the democratization of like the number of people across marketing who are actually going to be able to tap in to the power that we have, even with today's existing MarTech is going to be amazing. And I kind of feel once we get beyond that barrier of saying like, listen, you don't have to memorize screens and screens and screens of different menus and navigation options and configurations like that. If you can just simply talk to the software about what you want, it can instantiate it. I mean, again, so I'm excited about this. It's, you know, this is the sort of stuff. It would seem like it would be science fiction. My suspicion is we will see enough of that start to look realistic here in 2025 that it's going to change, change the game for everyone. That's such a powerful point. I actually went to college for programming, which meant me using a keyboard. This is like the cavemen of programming, right? Text is barbaric today because now you can just, as you said, speak to the AI and say, you know what, I'd like to see some code that does this and it will just do it. And you can move on to the next thing. And then compose much and much uh, more advanced things. This, this has been fantastic, Scott. Thank you so much. This is such an important topic for everybody to listen to. But for those who want to know more about you, about the, the report, where should they go? Sure. So my blog is chiefmartech.com without the H at the end. Long story on that. So yeah, feel free to go there and you can get a copy of the report. Fantastic. We'll have all those links in the show notes. Robin, any final thoughts? Scott, I just can't say thank you enough for this. I think you you gave everyone that rest assured feeling and that excitement about what's to come. And so if you haven't been able to check this out, everyone needs to go check out this report. I promise you if it's just something that you need to read over and it will help you with the insight coming up. But thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Fantastic. And remember, folks, if you want to learn more about what's happening in the MarTech landscape, Please subscribe on your favorite podcast player. We're talking to different MarTech solutions each and every week. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of The MarTech Show, hosted by Robin Diamond and Mike Alton, powered by Agora Pulse, the number one rated social media management solution, which you can learn more about at agorapulse.com. If you want to make sure you're part of our audience during live weekly broadcasts, take a look at our calendar at agorapulse.com forward slash calendar or click the subscribe button in your email once you register for any of these events. Is there a particular tool or topic you'd like to see us talk about? Or perhaps you think your solution should be featured? Email me at mike at agorapulse.com. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Christy Heiler hosts a fantastic podcast called Own It. Christy, tell us more about the show. Own It is all about celebrating women and non-binary advertising agency owners. We talk about buying out of the Boys Club of Advertising because less than 1% of ad agencies are owned by women. And where can people subscribe? You can find the podcast at untilyouownit.com. We're also on the Marketing Podcast Network at marketingpodcast.net. And of course, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You heard her. Go subscribe. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.